I thought I'd speak uh, for about 30 or 35 minutes about the strange story behind how I came to write this book, The New Zealand Project, a little about the basic argument of the book, about the need for a reassertion of a values-based politics, and then a little about what that looks like in practice. And in particular, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, prison policy and climate change. And then I'm really looking forward to conversation and discussion and disagreement. <laughs> so three years ago, I was really lucky to be working in New York in uh, Helen Clark's office at the United Nations. And I was having the time of my life uh, and feeling very privileged to be there. Um, and one week, uh, that sort of sense of euphoria uh, was broken when I started to have quite severe chest pains. I remember sitting in meetings with Helen Clark and beginning to worry uh, what would happen, about what would happen if uh, something went wrong in the middle of these meetings. And on the weekend, uh, I fainted in the apartment I was staying in in New York. I, after calling the health insurance provider that I had uh, to check that I could be covered, ended up going into hospital. And in hospital, I was told some really surprising and negative news. I was told quite abruptly um, that I had what's called an aortic aneurysm. That's uh, an expanded aorta, the blood vessel that carries blood and oxygen from your heart to the rest of your body. And an aneurysm is where a blood vessel expands so much that it's at risk of tearing with fatal consequences. And the next three or four months were some of the most terrifying and testing times of my life and they informed the writing of this book. I was told initially that I probably had a genetic condition and that the life expectancy for that genetic condition was 26.1 years, and I just turned 26. <laughs> I was told that I would need to have open heart surgery with a two to three percent mortality risk, uh, and I was told that the earliest I could have that surgery was in about two to three months time back in the United Kingdom. And so at any point in the lead up to that surgery, uh, there was a risk of my aorta tearing, which meant that any twinge I felt, any pain in my shoulder or a slight uh, twinge in my chest or a numbness in my foot, I kept thinking might have been my aorta beginning to dissect. At the same time though, something quite positive and unexpected happened. Uh, I went back to uh, the United Kingdom where I'd been living and had to push my flights uh, to New Zealand back to have the surgery. And at that time, I wanted to do anything except for think about the surgery. And I remembered that there's a very unusual exam at Oxford um, of the kind that probably only exists in Oxford. This exam is called the All Souls Prize Fellowship Exam. It's a 12-hour exam. It's uh, made up of four different tests, six hours on uh, a specialist area, six hours on general questions, followed by an interview, which is even stranger. So the, the questions are things like, uh, did Eve make the right choice, as in Adam and Eve? Uh, but if you get through the, that exam, you are met in an interview by 50 or 60 Oxford lecturers in gowns, all of whom can ask you a question on what you've said in your exam. I thought that I'd like to give this a go. I realize it's not everyone's idea of fun or everyone's, what everyone would have done in the lead up to surgery, but uh, the prospect that drew me in was the fact that people who pass the exam are given seven years of funding to do any kind of research or writing. Uh, and so I set the exam. To my surprise, uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought, uh, and I remember laughing when I read an email on my phone that said I'd got an interview. And to my even greater surprise, after what I thought was a terrible interview, uh, I was told that I'd passed the exam and that if I wanted, I could have seven years of funding to do any kind of research or writing. And that was one week before the heart surgery. So. Fortunately, as you might have guessed, I came through the surgery. Um, <laughs> I was extremely worried um, in the surgery. When I woke up, um, and I was told this later, um, I couldn't speak, uh, and I wrote uh, on pieces of paper a couple of notes, one of which said, 
to the doctors and surgeons, you're all champs. And the other one said, I'm so happy to be alive. But I found myself asking, what would I write on if this was the last thing I could write? And at the time, that was the mindset that I was in. But, but since, uh, or, or in, the, in the weeks after, I was told that I had good health prospects and that I could, could plan on a, a long and healthy life. But to me, the answer was pretty clear. I wanted to uh, give back to uh, Aotearoa New Zealand, a country that um, had given me so much through public education and in other ways. I'd always been fascinated by politics and law and policy in education and in broader interactions. Uh, and to me, it, it seemed that there were some things deeply wrong uh, in New Zealand politics that could be a whole lot better. And when I thought about politics, I didn't just have in mind what goes on in the beehive. I didn't just have in mind voting in parliament. I had in mind the full realm of politics. To me, that is about power. It is about how power is gained or lost in uh, ideas, through institutions and individuals and identities. And parliamentary politics is one part of that, but it's also about campaigning and activism and conversations. And so this was uh, about two and a half years ago, I set out to write a book. It's not something I'd ever done before. Uh, and I interviewed 20 or 30 people around this country, people from different backgrounds, um, activists, doctors, teachers, academics. And in my writing process, one theme emerged, which has become the core theme of the book. And that is that there's been a decline in values in our politics in Aotearoa New Zealand. And the argument is that we've seen a decline in values for three main reasons. First, because our politics has become a bit technical and technocratic. The language of politics reveals this, right? The language of consumers and clients rather than the language of citizens. But we also see this in policies like the social investment approach, which uh, sets out perhaps an admirable goal of, of targeting investment to those in need, but doesn't explain certain value judgments about how that investment happens or um, who specifically it targets. So that's the first reason I think that we've lost values in our politics, because uh, we've had a, a rise in a technical and technocratic understanding of politics, which sees politics as the preserve of a small number of people, not all of us. Secondly, I think there's been a general loss of a sense of direction in our politics. So we see, rather than discussions of vision, a kind of muddle through pragmatism, an approach to uh, politics that might suggest that uh, politics is about managing a company as opposed to leading a country. And this has been strengthened, I think, by this loss of direction, by this emerging strand of nostalgia in politics in different places around the world. Let's think of Trump's call to make America great again, or the references to Empire 2.0 in the UK in the aftermath of Brexit. That turning to the past, I think, is easier when we don't have a future-facing destination that we're working towards. On top of uh, a loss of a sense of direction and a rise of technocratic politics, I think third, there's been a rise of self-interest and selfishness in society at large, especially in the last 20 to 30 years. And evidence backs this up. So in the 1980s, we know that there were a series of reforms, economic reforms, sometimes known as Rogernomics or neoliberalism. These are the reforms that, for example, cut the top rate of income tax from 66% to where we are now, 33% over time. Reforms that cut the amount of money that goes to beneficiaries, reforms that chipped away at collective institutions such as unions and indeed the idea of us living in a society together. And what came out of this, I think, is a normalizing of the idea that it's okay to act in our self-interest. It's okay for us to vote selfishly and it's okay for our politicians to be self-interested too. Margaret Thatcher, who pursued similar reforms in the United Kingdom, said, the method is economics, the object is to change the soul. And I think in part this project of reducing the size of the state, reducing taxes, cutting away at welfare and unions has succeeded in shaping our collective soul by 
making it normal to act in our self-interest uh, and making it harder for us to talk about what we do together. And I think this has also been reinforced by a strain of mean-spirited and harsh celebrity culture. We see that in certain TV programs, we see that in the media, we arguably see that in the figure of Donald Trump. So I, 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 argue, I argue in the book that we need a reassertion of values in politics, where values are principles that we hold dear that contribute to a life well led. And a values-based politics is not just a politics motivated by values, because we do hear politicians talk about how they're inspired by values, especially in their maiden speeches at the start of their careers. It's also a politics uh, that secures values and outcomes that embodies values and how it's practiced, that manifests those values and how it's done, that follows through on values. And it's, I think, important that we talk about values because values connect to the heart as well as the head. As well, values we know move people into action. So research by groups like um, Common Cause shows that the way to persuade people to change patterns of behavior is not by flooding them with facts, not by flooding us with facts, but by appealing to our values. And the other significant thing about values is there's a long history of values-based decision-making in Maori culture. Uh, and so we see uh, a kind of history and a, and a resonance in values-based politics in the history of this land that we all live in. And it's not just any values that I call for in the book. I call for a specific set of values, in particular, three or three and a half values. Care, community, creativity, and perhaps love. And I chose these values because I think they're values that all New Zealanders can sign up to, whether you sit on the left or the right or outside of politics. I also think these are values that we see a deficit of in our current society and politics. So what do I mean by these values? What are care, community, creativity, and love? I think we all might have a picture of what these things mean in our own lives, but to me care is about looking outside of ourselves and having a deep concern for others and the environment. It's the value that we do honour when we stop and uh, see uh, what's happened to someone when they're struggling on the side of the road, when we move out of the way when an ambulance needs to pass. But it's a value that has been neglected, um, in particular in the last 20 to 30 years, as certain narratives about beneficiaries and prisoners and others have become normalised. Community is about recognising that we're all entangled, that we are interdependent, that we need each other, rather than being isolated units, isolated individuals. And I think we have grown apart as a country. I think we do see rising social distance between us, both in terms of economic inequality and in terms of segregation by ethnicity and, and where people are living around Aotearoa New Zealand, as work by Damon Salisa has, has shown. One other interesting feature of the need for community is the evidence we have about loneliness in our society. So the 2010 General Social Survey shows that young people are more likely to be lonely than older people in our community. That 18% of young people in the last month felt lonely compared to 11% of older people. And that uh, may not have changed over time, it's hard to measure that, but what it does reflect, I think, is a, a renewed sense of the need for community. Creativity is something we don't talk about so much in politics generally, but I think it's something that our politics needs and I think it is a value. And creativity to me means a sense of experimentation and imagination and play and a willingness to produce new things. Our window of what is politically possible in New Zealand has become very narrow, what some political scientists call our Overton window. And ideas outside of that window are very easy to dismiss. And I think the value of creativity is about widening that window. And part of that task involves also listening to voices that have long been neglected in our politics, including the voices of Māori and Pacifica, young people and recent migrants, as well as artists. And just to say something in particular about young people and, and artists, and I'll, I'll come back to um, other groups, those other groups, um, and, and those other parts of our community in a moment. I think the reason young people's views are so important is that young people tend to be more impatient and more urgent, uh, and that impatience and urgency 
meets uh, the, the gravity of the social challenges that face us. In relation to artists, I think, and I'm, I don't think this is to romanticize people working in the arts, I think artists are often the kind of canaries in our collective coal mine who express dangers before the rest of us have caught on. They're people that speak to the spirit of our times before the rest of us have caught on. And I think their voices uh, could invigorate our politics alongside the voices of those other groups who have been not heard for too long in our politics. Lo lying close to those values though, those values of care, community and creativity is the value of love. And the idea of a politics of love is also something that might seem new, but arguably through the value of aroha has long existed in marae and on Māori communities, in Māori communities. Love is a deep sense of warmth towards another. And I wonder in the book whether our politics might look a little different were it to be motivated by that deep sense of warmth towards each other as opposed to self-interest uh, and as, as opposed to the, the crushing cynicism that I think characterizes our time. I also say in the book that there are some things we need to get right before we pursue a fully fledged values based politics. I think we need to talk about what the state is good at and what the state can do. But if we are to move in that direction, we also need to discipline the state with people power and community action. And perhaps most importantly, I think we need an ongoing process of decolonization. I, as a Pākehā person, am not best placed to say authoritatively what decolonization means or requires, but drawing from the work of Linda Tuhuai Smith, and Tariana Turia, and Leone Pihama, and others, including Moana Jackson, you see, decolonization is about undoing and understanding the negative effects of colonization, recognizing the benefits of colonization, many of which have been secured for Pākehā, and recentering positively the worldviews of indigenous peoples in this country, Māori. It means lots of things in practice. In the book, I talk about te reo Māori in schools, for example, which is um, drawing on the, on the work of, of Māori voices. But Importantly, it involves conversations about who holds power, and it involves Pākehā, in some cases, being willing to give up power. And I think the reason decolonization uh, has to happen if we are to pursue a fully-fledged values-based politics is that without it, we pursue values of care, community, creativity, and love for some. We pursue these values on an unequal footing. And we also don't make the most of Māori values, which have so much to offer to an enriched values-based politics. So that's a little bit about the story behind writing the book and the basic argument of the book. And I thought before we go to sort of questions and comments, disagreement, we could talk a little bit about what it might look like in practice. Now, different people will have different understandings of care, community, creativity, and love. And as Tina Ngata said to me today, the gift is in the wānanga, in the discussion about what flows from these values. But I offer in the book one set of conclusions about uh, where care, community, creativity and love could take us. And I try to discuss this across a few areas, um, as Mark said, across the environment and gender, foreign policy, uh, work and the economy. But I'll just talk briefly about two areas, prisons and climate displacement. And then I'll say something uh, briefly perhaps about insecure work um, before talking and closing about how we get there. So New Zealand imprisons 210 per 100,000 people every year. And in case that sounds like that, that technocratic statistic that I wanted to get us away from, that is 30% more prisoners in this country than uh, per capita in Australia, 45% more than the UK, and 84% more than Canada. The only way we punch above our weight in the world when it comes to prison policy is in being the most punitive, and that's not something to be proud of. At the same time, Māori have made up more than 50% of our prison population since the 1980s, and people have called this out as a problem since the 1980s, and yet it gets worse. Moreover, we see a spate of violence in prison, prison suicides, and other mistreatment. To me, a values-based politics can involve care for victims who are an important group in our community, but it can also involve a better approach to prisons. 
Because prisons are a failure of the value of care. They deny people's sociability through undermining the ability for social contact and tearing families apart. They're expensive, they're inadequate spaces for rehabilitation, and essentially they don't work. So we need a new approach, and I traveled to Norway with the help of um, the Legal Research Foundation to see how Norway approaches prisons. And it was interesting, I, as a sign of the sort of trust in Norwegian society, when I turned up to Norway, I hadn't managed to finalize a visit to a prison, and I just sent a, a generic email to the Ministry of Justice website, and an hour later I got a call on my cell phone from an employee called uh, Ellen, and she said, um, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you can definitely visit a prison, and the bad news is it's uh, two hours away and you have to take a ferry, so why don't I drive you? Um, and she drove me two hours the next morning to a uh, port where I took a ferry to Bastoy Prison. The ferry was run entirely by prison inmates without any supervision, and on Bastoy Island, um, I saw a very different prison to the ones I've seen in New Zealand and in the UK. Um, and I should say, I, what I say here is, is not just the sort of reflection of an outsider to prisons, and I've, I've worked in different prisons, most recently in the UK with a, a great program called Learning Together, which brought together students and inmates to learn about criminology. But I got to this, pr this prison, and um, prisoners had the option of meaningful work. Some prisoners were, were doing fishing and agricultural work. Others were doing academic work. One principle that was discussed was normality, the idea that the prison should be designed as far as possible, like the outside world. Another was the principle of good neighborhood. And so the prisoners, the inmates, were paired very carefully together in the housing that they had to try to ensure that they were learning skills from each other. And the prison governor told me that justice means more than revenge. And memorably, he told me that revenge in criminal justice is a bit like pissing your pants in Norway at first it feels good, and then you start to freeze. <laughs> and what was clear in Norway, from talking not just to people at this prison, um, including inmates, but also to um, people in politics, is that Norway hasn't always been enlightened in criminal justice, unlike perhaps what we might assume. In fact, in the 1970s, Norway made a decision to shift its criminal justice policy because of three reasons in particular. One, a brave politician, Inga Louise Valla, who passed and led a series of uh, law changes. Two, the work of a campaigning group, CROM. Uh, and three, what one person described to me as um, an attempt to make forgiveness the central value as opposed to revenge. And what that shows is, I think, that a significant change in Aotearoa New Zealand could be possible too. And I think we need what Angela Davis describes as decarceration, a stepped phase out of our reliance on prisons. To the extent we still need something like prisons, I think they ought to be redesigned along Norwegian lines, but there are several things we can also do to radically reduce the size of our prison population, including the use of problem-solving courts, which involve supervised rehabilitation of offenders and have been known to work well, not just in New Zealand pilots, but overseas, and also changes to our sentencing laws for example, uh, adoption of a Canadian sentencing law which attempts to reduce um, incarceration of indigenous offenders. These in some ways are just tweaks, and we also need a serious look at institutional racism in our pr prison system, um, as well as the process of decolonization I described earlier. So I think a values-based politics can help us to see what's wrong with prisons, as well as how we might move away from relying on them. Just to speak briefly about two other areas. In the area of foreign policy, I think we've seen in how New Zealand is in the world, a rise of a different kind of self-interest in the last 20 or 30 years. A rise of collective self-interest, doing what is right for us uh, as opposed to what is ethical or values driven. I think we see this in a different approach to aid and development and across a range of areas. And I think a reassertion of a values-based politics could take us back to a truly independent foreign policy. And one uh, way this might change our foreign policy con concretely is in the area of climate displacement. Climate change is the most serious moral issue of our time. 
we won't have a values-based politics or a politics of love or aroha without planet Earth. And it is having a serious effect on places very close to us, including Kiribati and Tuvalu in the Pacific. Yet New Zealand is doing very little to stand with or to partner with our countries that are severely affected. This despite that the, most, the fact that the most famous case in the world on climate change refugees, a case involving a, a man from Kiribati called Ioani Taisiota, was decided in New Zealand a couple of years ago with no political response. So I say in the book that uh, an independent foreign policy which flows from values could involve us working with the Pacific to uh, ensure that there is support for people that have to move as a result of climate change. It does not involve speaking for the Pacific, but rather with them, with neighbours in the Pacific. And this means concretely, um, possibly support for an international refugee a convention focused on climate change refugees, amongst other things. Lastly, um, just in talking about the application of a values-based politics, I think a values-based politics could mean something very different for how we deal with work. We know that 635,000 people, a large proportion of our national population, is in insecure work, according to the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. That's part-time work or work that may not go on much longer, work that causes anxiety and stress. And this can lead at the sharp end of this kind of precarious work to uh, homelessness, to people sleeping rough, and it can lead to mental health challenges, and it certainly leads to low incomes. Yet I think uh, successive governments haven't grappled with this challenge, and in the book I suggest we might talk a bit more about new ideas like a pilot universal basic income. It's an experiment that focuses on paying everyone an income regardless of whether they work or not. And I think that would happen best locally. Um, and that kind of pilot, it gives people security to take risks perhaps, to, to take part in projects that are meaningful to them. It reduces the stigma that beneficiaries face at the moment. And it might remunerate domestic work uh, that currently receives no payment. There are some things uh, we might worry about in relation to a basic income. And I travelled to Finland um, to, to, to talk to people there about a pilot, but I think an experiment could help us to test uh, the pros and cons of a basic income, and it's a new way forward that I think deserves more discussion. So all this might sound nice um, and, and uh, kind of appealing in the abstract, but how do we get there? And, and, and here I sort of wrap up. I think the main way we get to realising a values-based politics uh, is in part through including more voices to reduce the barriers at the bottom of our politics and also to address the bottlenecks at the top. But it's also through organising and not doing this on our own but being willing to join groups of people, young and old, as that is the single most effective way that social change has happened in New Zealand, whether the example is the Māori Land March or New Zealand becoming nuclear free. And there are lessons we can learn from overseas, from recent activist movements such as at Standing Rock or Black Lives Matter. Lessons like speak the language of values and allow those most affected by an issue to speak since those are the people that will often speak most authoritatively and most urgently about the imperative of change. Another lesson is to empower young people without, uh, of course, forgetting the incredible power that can come from intergenerational coalitions of young people and older people. If organising is not for you or campaigning is not for you, I think we can champion the work that's already being done in communities, the values-based politics that's already being practised, and I think we can have conversations. Conversations about what we want to stand for, what we're proud of, what direction we want to be going in as a country, whether we want love to be a guiding principle of our politics. And those are conversations that can happen uh, on the left uh, or on the right, regardless of your political positioning. I spoke to Moana Jackson, uh, who has a connection to this region as part of my research for the book, and he told me, we often think of politics as the art of the possible, but unless politics is also the art of what is not quite possible, but what should be possible, we won't have a visionary politics. And I think we should heed that call to seek after a politics of what might not seem possible, but what should be possible. It's no easy task, 
But I, I think we can do it with all the imagination and the creativity and the love we can muster. Nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.